So now we add the fetus in, in the middle bottom, and we've got a brain and muscle, and on the right is the fetus, and on the left is the muscle and the brain of the mother. And what we show here is that adipose tissue on the top releases free fatty acids and glycerol. The glycerol can be converted to glucose in the liver, and that's the process of gluconeogenesis. The free fatty acids are changed into ketone bodies, and they come out as ketone bodies, which can then be used by the fetus, by the brain, or the muscles. And triglycerides are also produced, and they can also be used, but they're not used directly by the brain. So in the fed state, the focus is on glucose coming from ingested glucose. In the fasted state, the focus is on ketone bodies coming through in that way. Now, we've already discussed that the degree of ketosis is determined by the respective rates of insulin and glucagon secretion by the pancreas. Little insulin, and you're in the, fed, in the fasted state, lots of insulin is fed state. And then glucagon is the reverse. And so we've already argued that the degree to which nutritional ketosis will develop is determined by both the carbohydrate and the protein contents of the diet. And I've shown you our own research showing that as soon as you eat proteins, you reverse the nutritional ketosis within, within minutes. So now this is the issue, brain growth, sorry, brain growth by age, and this is the elephant in the room. And if you ignore it, you won't understand why nutrition of infants and neonates is different from, from the rest. Because this is what happens in the first two years of growth. You go from brain's weight is 20% of the body weight, and it goes up to 80% within two years. And thereafter, the degree of brain growth is much reduced. So this is a critical area, and this is what probably determines the future productivity of that child, is the brain growth during the first two years of life. And it's something that we have to publicize and acknowledge, that what we feed the children in the first two years has a greater effect on their lives than anything they do thereafter. And, and that's, I don't think that we emphasize that enough. Then we're going to move on to this book by Dr. Cunane, who is one of our expert witnesses. And his book is titled Survival of the Fattest, the Key to Human Brain Evolution. And we have discovered parts of the book, but it's not necessary because I've taken out what I needed from, those, from the pages. And so this is his hypothesis the fattest infants became mentally the fittest adults. Remember the point about humans are the only hominid species that produces fat babies. So his argument is the fattest babies became mentally the fittest adults. Body fat in human babies provided three forms of insurance for brain development that are, that not, are, that are not available to other land-based species. One, a large fuel source in the form of fatty acids in triglycerides. That's fatty acids stored in the fat cells. Two, the fatty acid precursors to ketone bodies. Remember, when you break down the fatty acids and they're released from the fat cells, the liver can convert them into ketones. And here's the key, which are the key substrates for brain lipid synthesis. And I'm not a brain lipid synthesis expert, but here's someone who is. And he says <coughs> ketones are the key substrates for developing the fats in the brain. And three, a store of long-chain polyunsaturated fats needed for normal brain development. And that's page 555 on the, dis the discovery. So, compared to glucose, ketones are the preferred sources of carbon to make fatty acids or cholesterol. And I think that there was expert witness from the complainant that glucose was the key metabolite needed to build the brains. Dr. Cunani disagrees. He says it's the ketones are the preferred sources of carbon to make fatty acids. The infant has a very high demand for cholesterol, but it can't import sufficient cholesterol from the rest of the body. Hence, the ability of the infants to turn oxidized fatty acids into brain cholesterol via ketone starts to make sense. This process is intimately linked to supporting brain development, and that is page 590 of book one. So the issue during human brain development was basically one of meeting the requirements of both brain development and high brain energy demands while simultaneously expanding the brain. 
So you've got a brain that's growing and it needs energy, but it also needs the substrates to grow. This had to be done while using small molecules like ketones that have mixed uses, i.e. they are good fuels, but simultaneously they're good, good molecules to build membrane lipids. And that's what makes ketones so remarkable, that you, the, the body can use them as a fuel, but they can also build membrane lipids from these ketone bodies. And why is all this important? Because the, one of this particular research has found that independent of all other factors, normal head size at eight months old in these infants was the best predictor of neurological and behavioral development at three years of age. So what happens to your child in the first few months of life determines their life trajectory. And that's terribly, terribly important. And in my argument is that the child needs fat during that period to have its best chance of developing the biggest brain it can have at two years. Because the bigger the brain, in general terms, the better the prospects for that child's intellectual development. And then he draws the, the point that the nation's health, intellectual health, might be determined by what we feed the children in the first few months of life. So the latest report of the UN Children's Fund states unequivocally that the brain power of entire nations is slipping because of a shortage of the right dietary nutrients, including iodine, iron, vitamin A and zinc. The report claimed that inadequate iron intake reduces the child's IQ by 5 to 7 points. And where do you find the iron? In meat and animal produce. While insufficient iodine reduces childhood IQ by 13 points. And the iodine, remember, comes from, from the sea. Iron deficiency is pervasive enough that it is estimated to reduce the gross domestic product of most affected countries by 2%. This report claimed that so ubiquitous is vitamin mineral deficiency that it debilitates in some significant degree the energies, intellects and economic prospects of entire na of nations. So it seems to me that that's quite important to consider, that the dietary guidelines have to make sure that we maximize brain growth in the first two years of life. And we'll go now to ketosis in infants. That's in Raising Superheroes. There's the title. And I'm going to then continue to say what, what, I, what actually appears in the, in the book to make sure that what I wrote in the book is compatible with, um, with what I'm telling you. So I wrote there, second, adequate ketone production during the first two years of life is crucial for the growth of the baby's brain. This is because, as I've told you, ketones are a key source of carbon for the brain to synthesize the cholesterol and fatty acid that it needs in the membranes of the billions of developing of nerve connections. Ketones are the preferred carbon source for brain lipid synthesis and they come from fatty acids recently consumed or stored in body fat. Again, emphasizing the importance of having fat babies that have got the triglycerides able to produce the ketones in the liver. This means that in infants, brain cholesterol and fatty acid synthesis are indirectly tied to the mobilization and catabolism of fatty acids stored in body fat. Thus, mildly elevated ketones are essential for normal brain development, at least in humans. And I'll give a reference, 41. In addition, maternal ketone body production protects the fetal brain during times of food scarcity, when the mother's blood glucose concentrations must fall. The fetal brain uses ketones instead of maternal, maternal glucose to cover its energy requirements. And let me remind you what I said before, that the mother is becoming insulin resistant. And as her insulin resistance develops, she's doing it to save the glucose to send to the child. But if she doesn't have enough glucose, the child will die unless it, she can produce ketones. And she also becomes more ketotic and able to send more ketones to the child, the infant in the fetus the fetus in her uterus. And that fetus has the capacity to use those ketones to cover its energy requirements. So the next paper that we've, we've uh, given is the critical role played by animal source foods in human homo evolution. And again, this is the point that I tried to make with our journey through human evolution and what happened at Pinnacle Point. And the point is that Animal source foods were crucial to our evolution because they allowed us to build this big brain. And that's where we differentiate ourselves from the other, other hominids. 
Without routine access to animal source foods, it's highly unlikely that evolving humans could have achieved their unusually large and complex brains while simultaneously continuing their evolutionary tra trajectory as large, active, and highly sociable primates. As human evolution progressed, young children in particular, notice this point, young children in particular with their rapidly expanding large brains and high metabolic and nutritional demands relative to adults, would have benefited from volumetrically concentrated high quality foods such as meat. Such foods are not generally available to many people today in low income nations. And he says that that is a negative, as we've, we've emphasized at great length. And as human evolution progressed, animal source foods likely achieved particular importance for small children due to the energetic demands of their rapidly expanding large brains and generally high metabolic and nutritional demands relative to adults. So it was the children, it was the infants who benefited most from the change from the, the diet when we introduced, introduced carnivory and we introduced meat. It was the neonate that benefited the most. Now, in this article, you will see there is an, this, this diagram, and it's titled The Relative Gut Proportions for Extant Hominoids. That would be Gibbons, Siamangs, Orangutans, Gorilla, Chinese, and human, uh, sorry, chimpanzees and humans. And what we've got here is the six species, stomach, the size of the stomach relative to the total intestinal length. Then we've got the small intestine length in the cecum and the colon. And what it shows is humans are utterly different, completely different. Their gut is utterly different from all the other primates. And why is it different? So humans are different because they do not have a different stomach. The stomach is relative to the total intestine, the same length. The small intestine is much larger, much longer, sorry, it's much longer in relative terms. And the cecum, which is the start of the large colon, is much less, and the colon itself is very short. And I showed you that diagram. These animals with these huge colons have massive extended abdomens because they ferment, they ferment food. They ferment cellulose and produce saturated fat which they then use for their metabolism. We don't do that. We do all our digestion, or most of it, in the small intestine. So that's the, the crucial difference. And the reason we do that is because we are carnivores and we do not have to ferment. So, digestion and absorption of nutrient-dense foods occurs in the small intestine, and that's where we focus our energy. What we do is we go and kill animals which have lots of fat in their bodies. And then we've invested, instead of having this huge colon to degenerate the fats, we say, well, let's let them do the job. We'll kill them. We'll eat them. And then we can get rid of all this wasted energy in the colon. So digestion and absorption of nutrient-dense foods occurs in the small bowel. And the fermentation of nutrient-poor foods, we leave it to, to the other animals, and we don't have a large colon. Man and this is, so this is absolute evidence that humans are carnivorous. We're designed for carnivory. We're not designed for fermenting plants in a large colon and cecum. So humans are primates adapted to carnivory. The next paper that I've, we've discovered is the apes dilemma to the weanlings dilemma, early weaning and its evolutionary context. And this talks about what happens when humans started to eat animals. The shift in the hominin prey image to the carcass and the use of tools for butchery, which remember came around about 2 million years ago, increased the amount of protein and calories available irrespective of the local landscape. However, the shift brought hominins into competition with carnivores, increasing mortality among young adults and necessitating a number of social responses responses such as alloparenting, where both parents are involved. The increased acquisition of meat about 2.6 million years ago had significant effects on the later course of human evolution and may have initiated the origin of the genus Homo. Now, that's the argument that I had been developing already. So their argument is that actually what first happened, we started scavenging. We didn't kill the animals, we scavenged the meat from 
an other animals that killed the animals and then we chased the, we chased the carnivores away and ate the food. So such a dietary shift, scavenging meat about 2.6 million years ago, would have particularly benefited three groups. Notice three groups. And they're all children. The developing fetus, lactating, sorry, not all children. Developing fetus, lactating females, and weanling children. Although the advantage to the fetus to mothers may have appeared earliest, it was the weaning child who benefited most in an evolutionary sense. Since it's, since it's during childhood, before seven years of age, that the structure and capability of the adult brain is established. Again, focusing on weaning onto a high meat diet and the benefits to the brain. And they're putting it in the evolutionary context. So it's not difficult to imagine a scenario in which play involved a nut processing hammer stone was shifted to a nearby carcass, leading to the discovery of a new and effective way to acquire brain and bone marrow. And that's crucial. So the, the, the carnivores, like lions, don't eat the brains and they don't break the bones open. So they were always left. And humans would have learned that they were highly nutritious, full of this fat, the, the brain and bone marrow. And so they would have shifted to eating that. So all they had to do now was let the animal be eaten by the lions and the cheetahs, and then they could get to the brains and the bone marrow. So the shift in the earlier hominins prey image led to the recognition of the carcass as food, effectively changing the course of later human evolution. So that's the hypothesis that was eating meat, and particularly the fat in the brain and in the bone marrow that allowed us to develop our large brain. So, so one of the questions was, well, there are, there are communities that are still hunter-gatherers, and the Hadza in northern Tanzania are one such population. And this is a paper published in 1962. And I was looking for, so what do the children of the Hadza hunters get fed? Because it's not cereal from, from Woolworths. It has to be something else. So the answer was that in this article, this is the, what the statement was. So infant feeding... They, they were, infant feeding was rendered soft fat as from the zebra and bone marrow, both raw and cooked, or introduced in the early months. So the child is weaned onto fat from the zebra and the bone marrow. And when the infant has two to four teeth, pre-chewed meat, so the mother pre-chews the meat, she's then fed, and by the age of about 18 months, the food, full adult range of foods will be consumed. So they will eat the meat, but they'll also eat some of the carbohydrate sources that are available. And so then the question was, well, how healthy were these children? And the main finding were the good health of the children in general, and particularly the absence of obvious malnutrition and anemia were probably related to the, to the excellent infant feeding patterns based on prolonged breastfeeding and the introduction of animal protein in the second six months of life in the shape of bone marrow and pre-chewed meat. So that's it, and that's how we've survived for 2.5 million years or so, eating these foods. And those are the foods that both the dietary guidelines for South Africa and in our books, we propose. And you see, when I responded to the complainant's letter, her first letter, I knew she didn't have a basis for a claim because I knew this. And we've been eating this food for millions of years. And if we hadn't weaned our children onto these foods, humans wouldn't exist. So on first principle, I knew the complaint had no basis. So one of our experts we were hoping to call in the first round was Professor Krebs from the United States. And the reason is that she's done some of the prospect, sorry, intervention trials where she's taken children and she's fed them different foods. And so she's measured the outcomes. So there are some studies in which feeding trials have been done, in which children have been given increased meat, increased protein particularly from meat, and see the outcomes. And that, remember, is what we call good science because that's intervention trials. And so what I've done is I've just included uh, these in a very brief form so we don't have to go to each of the scientific papers. But if you're interested, you'll see, for example, here this says, the article considered the potential role of meat and liver in addressing this apparent problem of zinc deficiency. In after hours, if you want to go and look at them, it, you'll find it on page 648 of the discovery. So those are the papers. So the next paper in pay, on page 654, which we're not going to go to because the, the key theme is, is there available for you. Conclusion in breastfed infants, higher protein, infant, protein intake from meat was associated with greater linear growth and weight gain, but without excessive gain in adiposity, i.e. in obesity or fat cells, 
suggesting potential risks of high protein intakes may differ between breastfed and formula fed infants and by the source of protein. So here they're given meat and there's no negative consequences. All they do is they get taller and they're still as lean as before or as lean as the group fed the different diet. And then the paper on page 660, introduction of meat as an early complementary food for exclusively breastfed infants and is feasible and was associated with improved zinc intake. And remember, we were concerned about zinc intake because that's deficient in children fed complementary foods which are not meat based. The high percentage of infants with biochemical evidence of marginal zinc and iron status, and this is in the United States of America in wealthy, well, relatively wealthy communities, suggests that in additional investigation of optimal complementary feeding practices for breastfed infants in the United States are warranted. So even when they fed meat, she's still unhappy that they're still not addressing the issues of zinc uh, deficiency because zinc is obviously more a problem than they've solved. And so she raises the question, the results, results of the study raise the question of whether current complementary feeding practices ideally meet that standard. So this is, she's again saying, conventional advice might not be ideal. Maybe we need to question it. And that's why we exist as scientists, to answer those questions and not to accept blindly that we have the answers. And that's why she's such an important figure in the field, because she doesn't accept the guidelines as being the final final solution. She's saying, I'm prepared to spend my life looking at better ways of feeding children. And then the next one on page 957, a high percentage of healthy infants who were breastfed only were iron deficient. So there's iron deficiency in the United States of America, not in, in the communities we're talking about. Dietary components potentially including specific micronutrients influence the character of the gut, the developing microbiome. And this is now where her new research is going. Because what we know is that the gut flora is critically important to our health. We know that if children are born by caesarean section, they don't have as well-developed gut flora as if they're born through the mother's birth canal. We know if infants are, are fed antibiotics. We know that if children are fed breastfed, they don't get an ideal gut flora. And so that all those questions of what effect does feeding say meat or cereals on the gut flora. We don't know, but she at least is looking into those questions. And the next study, zinc requirements for older breastfed only infants are unlikely to be met without the regular consumption of either meat or zinc fortified foods. And notice she doesn't say the consumption of zinc fortified foods or meat. It's meat and then zinc fortified foods, which is the op op better option? Meat, again, because it's in the regular package that humans have been eating for 2.5 million years and we know how to digest it. Zinc fortified foods, how do we know that that's the way we designed to digest these foods? So she said results of these studies, although requiring further verification, suggest that increased meat intake by breastfed infants older than six months old would adequately support both iron and zinc requirements. So there we go. Feed them complementary foods which are cereal based and you can't be certain that you're covering the iron and zinc requirements, even if they're fortified. But when you feed them meat, then they're, probably get it, then they're getting all the iron and zinc that they require. And it's recommended that infants transition to a diet consisting of 30 to 40% calories from fat, with a gradual reduction to 20-30% calories from fat by year two. And I don't think that that's going to be proved correct. I don't see any reason why you'd want to cut the fat consumption, the fat in the diet. And, and she's also influenced by this fear that I'm going to make the kids fat and they're all going to die of heart disease. But I think that's, that's going to be shown to be incorrect. But the point is, this would be described as a high-fat diet, which is the diet that I, we prescribed in the Real Meal Revolution and in Raising Superheroes. And this is, again, more on the ketosis in, in infants. And I want now to, to move on to ketosis and ketone bodies and discuss again how crucial ketone bodies are for the infant development and particularly the brain development of the of the infant 
Now, one of the complaints, and this I just readdressed in page 322 on raising superheroes, is that ketone bodies are damaging and dangerous for the child, the neonate, because there is some publication out there which suggests that children born with mothers who were in ketosis are, don't do as well or have more brain damage or whatever. So I wanted to go and look at the basis for that complaint. And the study I came up with was this one. And what it shows were there were no teratogenic, i.e. no cancer producing effects in animal studies where they had raised the blood ketone bodies to values found in normal pregnancies. And I've given you the, the data and it comes from this article. So recall, I. Because I have a responsibility, I'm writing a book, I must be certain when people say that something happens and it's negative, I've got to go to the source. So I went to the source and this is the paper. And what he was trying to achieve, this guy, was to show that he could induce abnormal cells in the brain brains of research animals. In fact, he chose rats. And he took rat fetuses and exposed them to different concentrations of ketone bodies and different concentrations of glucose. And then he looked at those brains to see had any of them developed teratogenesis, i.e. indicating that they were developing cancers. And here's the actual data from, from the slide, from the data. And here, the top panel, the very... The very top is, it says glucose 1.2 milligrams per ml, and you'll see that there's a small little black, dot, black square next to it. And that's the control group. And what that shows us is that there's very little effect of glucose 1.2 milligrams per ml. Very few uh, lesions were developed. However, if you increase the dose to 12 milligrams per ml, you see that there are about 50% of these rats develop abnormalities and a lot of them are major in red and some are minor. But as you reduce the glucose concentration down to the normal range, six milligrams or three milligrams, you'll see there's very little evidence for teratogenesis. So what that tells you is it's not just ketones that are dangerous for the, for the baby's <coughs> brain, it's also glucose. And that point wasn't perhaps made. And remember, that's why the infant is secreting insulin. So in the diabetic mother who's producing too much glucose, the brain of the infants being exposed to too much glucose, it has to secrete insulin to get the glucose down to make sure it doesn't have brain damage. 